joined Sukafina earlier this year at the end of June. Uh, I came from another trading company back then. Um, Sukafina, um, similar to my old company, which was called C. Uh, Dorman in, uh, in Kenya, uh, works a lot with, uh, with pharma training. I think uh, my background is a little sort of mixed between what Rachel called like the jungle gym and the deep dive. Uh, sort of been through many uh, different phases. Um, Sukafina is uh, about sustainability and coffee and finance. So that's, our, that's our name. Um, we have our 40th anniversary next year. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what we do and sort of how we work on the ground where we have what we call origination. So we, we own washing stations in East Africa. Um, we um, have companies in countries where we don't do the primary processing, but we work as exporters. Or we work as um, sort of liaisons between um, buyers and, and farmers in, in other origins. So we kind of do a, a good mix of all sorts of, uh, of operations. Um, I, I wanted to come here and talk a little bit about the financial markets, which is where I'll, I will begin uh, talking. And, uh, and I realize um, that it's something that's kind of maybe missing a little bit because we tend to kind of divide ourselves into the very sort of high-end specialty people or the very commercial people. And, and a lot of people that I've talked to here um, last night and today so is like, well, you know, I kind of, I work in a coffee shop, but we don't really do specialty. Uh, and there is, uh, and, and I, you know, definitely work in a, in a very uh, funny mix between very high-end specialty coffees and high-end commercial coffees and really rubbish coffee as well. Because all coffee has a home. I think we learned that from Claudia uh, previously. Uh, last week in Geneva um, was really busy. It was like a big, big barista camp for um, all guys that likes to wear a suit and a tie. Uh, it's called uh, the Swiss Coffee Dinner. Um, and it's sort of a week of meetings and a lot of big buyers and a lot of big uh, traders come. And uh, it also just ends up with this, uh, with this dinner on a Friday night. And uh, the CEO of Sukafina, uh, the guy that hired me, uh, his name is Nicolas Tamari, and he did the keynote speech at the dinner. And he said in the speech to the whole audience, like all these very big buyers and traders and shippers and, and a lot of people involved in the industry, and he said, what if we can make coffee the first truly sustainable agricultural commodity? And I think, I think we can do that. And so I kind of rewrote this talk a little bit. Um, before Nicholas's speech, we had sat down one morning earlier last week um, to discuss how we can make coffee truly sustainable. And, uh, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, and to be fair, my bosses are very visionary. We have a clear goal with Zucafina that by 2025, we're going to sustainably impact the lives of 400,000 farmers in a positive way. Uh, we're not even halfway there, so we have a lot to work on. Um, but let's, uh, let's start with the beginning. Before moving to Geneva, I was uh, living in East Africa for the past four years. Um, and I want to share a field perspective with you on how I think we can make coffee uh, truly sustainable and what the future of coffee looks like. Uh, truth is, coffee is produced by people who live stuck in economies that are very far behind our economies here in, in Europe, in the US. Um, and that means that they, in a literal sense, are diverging from the rest of mankind. Uh, we have more than one billion of our fellow human beings left behind. And I think that's a huge failure for humankind. But at the same time, I believe these are very solvable problems if you just take the right strategies. So I want to spend the next 20 minutes um, engaging our brains, uh, engaging our uh, collective passion for problem solving. But like I said, I'm going to start you off by giving you some, um, some background to these uh, financial markets. Um, and I think I wish someone had talked to me about it when I started in coffee 17 years ago. Um, and I think truth is it's not very interesting to most people and it seems pretty complicated. Uh, a lot of people have no idea how coffee is traded. Um, but I think that financial markets are incredibly interesting. Um, one of the most interesting things you can talk about. 
You can ask my boyfriend about that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, future markets for things like agricultural commodities or interest rates or financial securities, they are markets about the future. So there is a quote that says that the essence of uh, finance is time travel. And I think there's a beautiful quote about finance. It says, uh, saving is about moving resources from the present into the future. Financing is about moving resources from the future back to the present. Stock prices reflect cash flows into an infinite future. Long-term interest rates contain within it predictions about the whole series of future short-term interest rates. Markets are constantly predicting future actions, and as those actions move closer in time, the predictions become more solid and precise. And all these markets that I mentioned, uh, commodities, financial securities, interest rates, they can, in some sense, predict the future. And future matters, right? Because we're probably going to be around in 2050, like we just heard. Uh, we might live to be 100 years old these days. So the true beauty about futures markets is that we have prices for the future. So I'm going to give you an example so that we can uh, see a little bit more concrete what we're talking about. So I want to do some research. And you have to sort of choose between two options. So my question is, market players in the coffee market sometimes hold coffee without selling it, putting it in temporary storage in anticipation of higher prices later. Do you think, A, it will cost less coffee available to coffee roasters, creating a shortage in the market, or B, it will cost less shortages in the market? So who thinks A? <laughs> and who thinks, anyone on A? No? Anyone on B? A few people on B as well, and, and some, some undecided? That's fine. Um, I, I think uh, it will, uh, well, I think both, both answers are wrong, really. Uh, because if you think of it this way, and, and sort of the, the simplest way to talk about this is that, uh, you know, you have a coffee far harvest, and it comes once a year. Uh, and it has to be held in storage over a year, right? Because the roaster won't roast it, uh, and people don't brew it and drink it all at once. So you need it over the, the whole year. So somewhere somebody is storing coffee. And it's a little bit theoretical, but just you know, stay with me. Uh, to keep it very simple, you know that somewhere there is someone in a warehouse holding the coffee that you will be brewing in your coffee shop in six months' time. So if the holder of this coffee thinks prices are going to be higher later, they're probably going to hold the coffee in storage and not uh, release it to the market. And what does that really do? It, it evens out the price. Um, it doesn't make it worse. If they think there's going to be a shortage of coffee, they hold the coffee and the price goes up. Um, and so everyone starts consuming a little bit less coffee because of this higher price. And it smooths things out. And it works better. Um, I think it's Adam Smith that calls it like the invisible hand in the market, if you studied uh, in high school and heard about this. Um, but uh, it's very elementary economics, but I think uh, it's not so well understood by most people. Um, all right. So I wanted to show you the coffee market um, and, and what we look at every day. Um, and, and it will be easier to explain this way, I think. So this is uh, what the coffee market looked like last Friday. This is a report uh, I read pretty much every day. I think it's a very neat uh, setup. If you're a trader or if you, if you have interest in this, there are many, many different reports available. And you can view it live on, uh, on Reuters. Uh, uh, or there are other websites where you can actually follow the market uh, every hour of the day. Um, and so. I think uh, what you need to know about this is that one contract, one lot on this market, covers 37,500 pounds. Um, and a pound is about uh, 454 grams. Um, prices are listed in cents per pound. Um, so, so it's traded in the US, uh, in New York. But, uh, but anyone can just get dollars and, and start trading in this market. If you come from Japan, you change your yen into dollars, you set up a margin account, and you can start trading in coffee. Um, so this first column lists the delivery months. Um, so it means um, that where you see deck 16, 
Uh, that is the coffee price for futures, deliverable in December 2016. Um, and the price now, or last Friday, was 148 cents per pound. And then there is March next year, and I think this goes about uh, two years uh, into the future. And, uh, and as you can see, there is not much activity very far in the future. It's, it's more heavy on, on the activity nearby. Um, what it also tells me, uh, if you look at the DEX16 uh, price, so the first column after the MOM is the change. Um, and it says that it changed by 1.6 uh, cents. So you just calculate your, your um, gain or loss on the market. So you have 1.6 cents times 37,500 pounds. Um, and I already checked that $600. So, so now you, you made $600 on the market, let's say that. Uh, you had sold your futures and you were buying them back and you gained 1.6 since the previous day. Um, then you can sort of follow how high the market went, how low it went, the volume, the open interest, um, the open interest change, um, and then the, the, the switches on the very far right. So if you had the futures in December and you wanted to roll them to March, this is the price you uh, could do it at. Um, yeah. So that's uh, what you look at every day if you want to pay attention to the market. And in some sense, it is quite tied into specialty coffee as well because I've been in coffee for long enough to see that the prices do follow. Um, you, you certainly pay a premium and it's, it's quite independent, but of course when the C price was 350, specialty coffee was worth six or seven dollars per pound. When the C market is 150, uh, if you're willing to pay double price, you really only have to pay three dollars. So, so there is, uh, there is uh, some sort of uh, relationship between the two of them. Um, there are also other ways of looking at the market. Um, this is a candlestick chart, which I also like. Um, I can't really see it on my tiny screen here, but um, um, you, you have the, the last trading day is, is that um, very uh, bright green candlestick on the very far right. Um, and it's showing that uh, the close was higher than the day before. Um, that's why it's green, so all the red ones was with the lower close. You can also see how high it went or how low it went. Even if it closed at, um, at a, a higher price than the previous day, it failed to close as high as the previous day's high. Um, and, and that sort of predicts something about the market. And you have um, the moving day averages, so you can see what the average has been for the last uh, 200 days. Is that yellow line? The, you have the... Um, the different uh, 26 days high and low. You have the, typically you look at the 50 day and the 10 day. Those are maybe my, my favorites for <laughs> looking at this. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole lot of other things to say as well. Um, I mentioned that you uh, have to open a margin account. And so you have to actually spend some money if you want to get in this market. I'm sure you can call up a broker after this and say, hey, I want to get in the market. And they say, okay, do you have $20,000? And you're in. Um, but of course, uh, you trade and, and you made $600, but then another day maybe you lose $5,000, and, and so you go um, up and down until you have no money left. But the nice thing is, <laughs> well, the nice thing about this market, and it, it is how most coffee is traded. Most coffee is not traded at uh, level money, is what they call it. So at the market price, they're traded at a premium or a, or a negative, uh, a discount. Uh, depending on the quality of the coffee. And, and you can agree with a producer that you're going to pay 100 over market when you take delivery of the coffee. So that's sort of how these contracts are typically agreed. Um, but if you do have a margin account and you want to start trading coffee, there is no counterparty risk. Zero. You have no risk of, of someone not delivering. Um, and if you are, if you are the seller, you have, you have no risk at someone not taking it because these are very specific contracts. They're very standardized. There is tons of people that sit in New York and they're grading coffee. And I'm just imagining they're just like a bunch of retired traders and they're really good cuppers and they're very skilled on green coffee. And they know exactly what the, uh, what the rules are for, for putting coffee on the market. And so they're true coffee experts and, and there is no risk. It's risk-free. It's perfect. Um, <laughs> but, uh, 
So, so I got a little bit uh, more into this than I had planned to actually. Um, but I think the, in, the interesting thing and, and the important thing to remember is that, as you can see, this market is going up and down. So we've seen the, in the past two years, we've seen the 200, the 220, but we've also been kind of <laughs> lurking around the 100 cent uh, 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 number. And uh, this market volatility leads to income volatility for millions of people. Uh, and at the end of the day, that is a bit of a problem, um, knowing that we're dealing with millions of farmers growing coffee in some of the poorest regions of the world. So I'm gonna, you can ask me many questions about this when I'm done, I'm very happy to talk about it, but I thought I would take the opportunity to talk also and pick up a little bit where Claudia left off, um, talking about coffee farmers, the forgotten heroes. I once had a client um, in Belgium and he wanted to buy a really crappy coffee. And I had lots of crappy coffee, so that's not the problem because all coffee has a home and nobody's producing only the top quality, but it was one of those coffees that was so bad. It was just like the rubbish that doesn't even look much like coffee. And we agreed in a very nice price. I think it was like 20 under, so that's very cheap. That's uh, today, that, or on Friday, that would be 128 cents per pound. But he says, I think it would be much easier for me to sell this if it came with a story. And I thought, well, somewhere, you know, you have to draw a line. I was like, what sort of story do you want to have with this coffee? Uh, and he was like, well, I was thinking something about like animals or, you know, elephants, giraffes, whatever. And I was like, well, you know, this coffee was probably produced by someone who's so poor they didn't even send their kids to school. Like they might not even have shoes. That's why this coffee looks like crap. So, so he, didn't get the, he didn't get the story. <laughs> Um, and, and there is a correlation between um, quality in coffee production and available income. And so it is, like Claudia was saying earlier, it's a, it's a little bit of a catch-22 for producers. But think about this. The majority of the world's poor are farmers. That's extraordinary. Um, if that is really the picture that represents the world, world's poor, um, it kind of gets me really excited because all these people have one profession. You know, they're very, uh, they're, they work very similarly. Um, and, and if we can sort of help them improve their production and be more productive and produce better quality, then so many people can just climb out of this poverty. And it gets even better. Um, because, of course, these people produce coffee, but I think most of the very uh, tiny small holders, they produce coffee, but they also do subsistence farming. So they, they do other food crops. Um, and there are only two ways to feed the world. We can either um, make the existing farmland more productive, or we can cut through forests and savanna and sort of make more farmland available, but that would kind of be a disaster, and it's not really uh, what we, what we want to do. Uh, we have a very clear strategy um, for farmer training at Sukafina, and it's sort of our cornerstone. It, it's the most important thing we do. Uh, it's to make them more productive. When farmers become more productive, um, they earn more income and they climb out of poverty. And I have to mention this. Um, most of the actual farmers, in terms of doing the actual farm work that I know, are women. She is physically strong, mentally tough, and she will do whatever it takes to earn a better life for her children. So if we're gonna put the, coffee, the future of coffee into one person's hands, I'm really glad it is her. There's just one problem. Um, the, in the countries where we operate in East Africa, many smallholder farmers lack access to basic tools and knowledge. The tools they're using, they're tilling the soil with these like ancient like hacks and pangas like the machete. Um, and it, it's, kind of Bronze Age farmer techniques. Um, and I think it's kind of leaving them behind just because of the lack of tools. But <laughs> good news, again, we have actually solved a lot of these problems in general in agriculture um, more than 100 years ago. So I'm gonna talk about three basic steps in farmer and farmer training, which, uh, which are kind of the three things I think it will take to, to move forward with the, this industry. And I'm gonna start with where we kind of left off earlier, um, talking about uh, hybrid varieties. 
because I think we need to take climate change really seriously, like this guy said on the news earlier. Um, we need to help the farmers um, to be less susceptible to climate change and, of course, also not to contribute to it. So there is a lot more that goes into this. Um, we need to do it through capacity building. Um, we need to create drought-resistant varieties, disease-resistant. We need to reduce greenhouse gases. Like you said um, earlier, that hybrid seeds, I don't know where Ben is. Did he disappear? Uh, hybrid seeds are, are created when you, you pollinate um, two plants together uh, naturally. Um, and if you cross-pollinate a disease-resistant variety with a drought-resistant variety, you have a hybrid variety. Uh, of course, it takes a lot of research and a lot of uh, efforts to make a stable hybrid variety. Um, but I was listening to this very uh, nice friend of mine called Tim Schilling last week. Uh, he did also a speech in Geneva. And he was talking um, about coffee varieties versus other um, agricultural products uh, and how many varieties they have. Um, does anyone know how many coffee varieties we have if we were to have a seed catalog? Heaps, as in a number, around 40, 25, 100, 36, very good, well done. And do you know how many varieties of watermelon we have? Two, 1,000, two, anything in? Huh? One? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's 2,690. Um, there is a really good organization that we are cooperating with, with Sukafina, called worldcoffeeresearch.org. We're doing a lot of demonstration plot. Of, of, we will do a lot of uh, weather and monitoring we also have a, a Robusta farm in Ecuador where we're doing specialty coffee or specialty Robusta, so fully washed Robusta, where we're also doing a variety trials. Um, but if you have interest, visit worldcoffeeresearch.org. It's a really good web page. Um, and I'm just going to continue <laughs> uh, with saying that uh, classical conventional fertilizer, it used correctly um, can make a huge difference. If you microdose even just a little pinch of fertilizer to a tree that's taller than I am, you unlock an enormous yield gain. Um, that's what we call farm inputs. But they need to be combined with good agricultural practices. When you space your seeds and you plant with massive amounts of compost, farmers multiply their harvests. These um, proven tools and practices have more than tripled agricultural productivity in every major region of the world. And it has moved mass numbers out of poverty. We just haven't finished delivering this um, to everybody just yet. And in particular, we haven't delivered to Sub-Saharan Africa. I think it's also important for specialty coffee because quality is suffering because uh, soil is depleted of uh, the natural uh, nutrients. Um, there is not enough focus on soil renewal. Um, there is not, not enough uh, availability of, of conventional and organic inputs. Um, there is a huge lack of erosion control, um, which is just becoming harder with uh, climate changes. And these economics are really hard to understand. Um, they're really hard to explain. And it's a difficult decision to make for, for smallholder farmers, because if you have very little um, there are many temptations on where to spend your money. Um, and let me tell you, coffee is a very forgiving crop. And as I said, I used to live in Kenya, and I've been picking coffee cherry up country and planting it in my garden. And I have coffee trees, uh, even if I do nothing. So, so we like to say, you know, there's all this focus on soil and good agricultural practices. But coffee is, a, you know, you plant coffee, and out comes coffee. So, so if you're if you're really uh, a coffee farmer, it's part of your crops. How do you make the decision to kind of invest in more labor and putting in uh, the right kind of inputs that are probably more expensive than what you can buy in the little kiosk in town? 
and then increase your yield tenfolds. Because ultimately, if you can produce more and better coffee, that's when you can start tapping into this very attractive and interesting market, which is a specialty coffee market. But overall, I think this is amazing news because we have actually solved agricultural poverty a century ago in theory. So, so it is really just about delivering this to the rest of the world. Um, and I'm going to talk li a little bit about the delivery. This is one of our farmer trainers, Patrick, in, in Rwanda. Um, and it's really these guys that's going to end this poverty. It's people delivering these goods and services that's going to change the world. Um, and, and probably in our lifetime, by 2050, things are going to look very different because of this. Um, so these are the three things that I want to talk about. And to me, the most powerful driver for changing the world is delivery. Um, I think we all have to come together, coffee companies, private companies, from all across the supply chain, governments, NGOs. Um, and if we really do it together, we can eliminate all this poverty. Um, I wanted to show you a little video just to show you how um, Sukofina is operating at Origin. So you get a, an impression and then we can do some Q&A after. Yeah? Sukhafina is a family-owned business headquartered in Geneva and the group has been operating in uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi since the 1990s and more recently we established ourselves in Tanzania. Through Sukustainability we are now able to fully integrate the supply chain from growers to roasters. So what has been the approach? Well we recognize that we weren't in a vacuum and uh, requested the assistance of the Tanzania Coffee Board local authorities, millers, transporters, and other service providers, and very importantly, from banks. From the producer side of the equation, we targeted existing farmer groups that for some reason were not operating. We helped uh, groups and co-ops reform themselves and establish structures. We intervened with banks to providing financing. We did some uh, infrastructure rehabilitation sourcing materials overseas at lower costs and in some cases we provided some seed financing just to get the ball rolling. On the buyer side of the supply chain we listened to what the market was requesting and narrowed it down to three things traceability, quality and recurring stable supply. CPU started in 1966, about 50 years ago. And all the years things were well, was well, but just seven years ago, 
the CPU collapse. When the factory dies, our people, our farmers, was in a great trouble. And now they can send their children to schools, building houses. very well on, uh, on, this, on this start and we hope the company will continue to help us more and more. My name is Rafael Kundi, uh, the operations manager for Suka Sena Digital Tanzania Limited, a subsidiary company of Suka Fina International based in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, Suka Sena Tanzania Limited is a company whose main uh, activities is parchment coffee buying, um, with a major focus on buying good quality coffee. The company started its operations in Mbinga in March 2016. By then, it had no one to work with but it started to look for groups and cooperatives to work with. Um, right now, the company is working with six cooperatives, with 18 washing, washing stations, and uh, about 2,000 farmers. In Mbinga, coffee is the main cash crop, and most people do farm coffee, from which they get cash to buy food crops and pay for school fees, medical services, there is no life in Mbinga without coffee. And therefore, any value you add to, 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 to Mbinga coffee, it means that you add value to the livelihood of uh, people, Mbinga people. We are proud of what we've achieved so far. Um, washing stations that were lying idle are now operating. Um, quality has improved, along with farmer returns, and uh, farmer groups have definitely been revitalized. I think that our longer-term success will be measured by continuous quality improvements. We do the vacuum packing, which is also very exciting, but we'll uh, leave that for now. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll do the, the Q&A. Okay. Anta Marie, thank you for this presentation. Thank really you. interesting.